Okay, go ahead, Graham. Hello, and welcome to the Biotem Security Party with our guest today, Stephen M. Levin. My name is Graham Scar, and I'm coming to you from sunny Nottingham in the UK. I'm Susan Lowell Desolorsino, coming to you from the strange land of Washington, D.C., United States <laughs> of America. And I'm Chris Morita Clancy, coming to you from the Coast Salish Territory, just outside of Vancouver, Canada. So let you know that this is a production of the Stephen M. Levin Biotensibility Archive on Zoom, and we're also going live on YouTube. So I think to, to start off, we'll ask Steve if you'll give a toast to proceed, open the proceedings. Well, I'd like to toast to my uh, old friend, Tom Flemons, who's no longer with us. And the reason I'm toasting is I thought about it today because Tom, in addition to doing all these models behind me and many more, never let me get away with anything. He always challenged everything I said, and I had to get, make, it sure, make sure that he understood what I was trying to get across. So I toast him because I hope you people will do the same. Don't let me get away with anything because I'm going to put out some stuff today that's a little bit out, far out, and I hope I get challenged on it. So to Tom. Cheers. Jean Jean. To Tom. And we have Dorothea with us today. Dorothea, can you give a wave? Dorothea Blostein is the um, curator for the Tom Flemons archive. If you've not been to that website, uh, it is, well, just prepare yourself. It's a deep, deep, deep well, and you can disappear for hours without knowing it. It's delightful. Back over to you, Graham. Sorry. <laughs> okay, we're about to start. So if you'd like to turn your videos and audio to mute, videos off and audio to mute, and we'll uh, start. I welcome our guest, Stephen Levin. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm going to, um, this is a presentation that I put together. I made it into a video. Uh, it, it runs about 35 minutes and I hope it, it gets everybody thinking and asking questions um, because some of it is uh, without any proof, just theoretical approaches to the problem. So let's give it a try. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. All right. Ezekiel saw the wheel. He saw that wheel. Way in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. In the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel. This will be a discussion of the forces that get us to move the dynamics of biologic systems. And I will use my friend Serge Krakowiecki to start the discussion. I've known Serge Krakowiecki for 40 years. In addition to his giving some of the best and most humorous lectures ever, he has provoked me into thinking thoughts that I would never have thought of without his input. One of them is, Species survival is subject to the second law of thermodynamics. Simply put, if there's a less energetic way of doing something, organisms will find it. During my stint in the military, I learned the soldier's second law of thermodynamics. Never stand when you can sit, never sit when you can lie down, never stay awake when you can be asleep. Serge points out that muscles are gas guzzlers and animals must minimize their use. This boils down to getting maximum movement while using minimal effort. Movement has two components, horizontal velocity and a vertical force vector, usually related to gravity. Together they produce motions that resemble a sine wave and the oscillations of a pendulum of spring. The resemblance to pendulums and springs has not gone unnoticed 
I was remarked on by Borelli, who is considered to be the father of biomechanics, in 1680. Over the centuries, running has been thought of as using a different mechanism than walking. There were two models for movement, the pendulum model for walking and the spring mass model for running. A key difference is that the center of mass is the high point in the pendulum model, but the low point in the spring mass model. In the usual models, both use a push off from the ground and braking as the foot hits the ground. The concept of propulsion and braking is the same, except in the pendulum model, push off is powered by internal muscles and in the spring mass model, the springs are powered by the ground reaction force in response to the body loading the ground. To me, this is a giant step forward as it uses gravity instead of gas guzzling muscles to move us around. Current thinking is moving to a spring mass model for walking and running. The spring mass model has its origin in the early 1800s when Carnot wrote about the body of springs, but it's only in the last several years that anyone has paid uh, any attention to his work. I think we can now say that both walking and running are based on spring mass models. The most accepted model, but not what I subscribe to, is the leg-driven spring mass model, with the spring primarily in the calf muscles, tendons and ligaments being loaded by the body weight as it hits the ground. The foot pushes against the ground and the ground pushes back. The lever raises the heel from the ground and the, and the body is pushed upward. We mustn't lose sight of the fact that the springs cannot produce mechanical energy. They can only return energy loaded previously by an external force. Let us try and clarify what we mean by push-off and lift-off. Push-off is when two opposing forces interact with each other and there is an equal and opposite reaction. A springboard pushes the person into the air. Push-off. Lift-off is when the stored energy within a system uses that energy to pull away from the interface on which it was resting. Helicopters and rockets lift off. They lift themselves off the ground. They do not push away from it. Before we go much further, let's review a few principles about forces that we will apply to body in motion. I touched on it briefly at the very beginning, and here's more of it from accelerated speed training. So force has a very specific direction and it produces acceleration specifically in that direction. So let's say this is a, we'll call it a resultant vector. We can break this up into smaller component vectors, which are perpendicular. Okay. Now we're going to make those component vectors perpendicular because perpendicular forces have no influence on each other. So when it comes to problem solving, uh, you want to make all your forces perpendicular so you can treat each direction separately. Okay, it makes things very simple. Uh, perpendicular forces have no influence on each other. Uh, a force cannot produce, produce acceleration that is perpendicular to that force. All right, so vertical force can't produce horizontal acceleration. Horizontal force cannot produce vertical acceleration. Uh, very important concept to understand. I hope you've got the point. Vertical and horizontal forces are separate and do not affect each other. Any vectored force that is not horizontal or vertical is always an hypotenuse of those two forces. And in case you missed it, here is a bullet being fired from a gun, assuming the gun is horizontal, which hits the ground first, the ejected uh, cartridge or the bullet traveling on its horizontal path.
they hit the ground at the same time because the horizontal speed of the bullet has nothing to do with the vertical forces uh, pulling the bullet to the ground. And one more time. Why does the stone bounce and not sink? There's a horizontal force that propels it, and if there's a slight bounce of the water, that delays its sinking. It will propel forward. Because there is drag from the water, it is slowed until the forward motion is stopped and finally sinks. If there were no drag, the forward motion would continue on indefinitely. This is Scott Turner, Professor of Biology at Syracuse University. As of January 2022, uh, this video is still up on the internet, in fact, on this prestigious Academia EDU channel, so it probably is part of his present thinking. Uh, the video is directed at the pendulum model, but much of it applies to any leg-driven model. Just to remind ourselves, walking involves the forward motion of the body as it pivots around the ankle and hip joints. As the body moves forward, it describes an arc over an angle theta that is part of a larger circle of radius L, the length of the leg. Remember, we have described here the half stride. Let's analyze the forces at work. To propel the body forward, there must be a forward force C that acts parallel to the arc. This force C must act against the weight of the body, W, which is always oriented vertically. Here's a close-up of those forces, just so we can see them more clearly. Work must be done to initiate the half-stride, and this work is oriented in the direction of the force C. This work comes from the muscles. Only once sufficient work has been done to elevate the body's center of mass to the top of the arc, can gravity act to complete the half stride? Let's look at this a bit deeper. Professor Turner is talking about the pendulum model. We learned in first year physics that an external force is needed to move a body at rest. Muscles are internal forces, and if W is an external force, which it is, then you need an external force to move it, which is Newton's first law. This invalidates the pendulum model. So it is clear where we're going. Let's do a bit of math. C is the direction where the body is moving. As Tony Sabanos taught us, we can vector the forces into two components, a vertical and a horizontal component. C1G is the force that gets us up into the air. It has to be an external force. It is uh, equal and opposite to W. W being the accelerating force of the body hitting the ground, and there is an equal and opposite ground reaction force. As pointed out by Dr. Turner, and I fully agree with him on this, W cannot produce a horizontal acceleration, and muscles acting on their own cannot produce a significant vertical force. So then how do we get the body to move? So let's step back a bit and look at this diagram again. Since muscles acting on their own can't move us, we need an external force. Here is where the spring mass model comes in. The springs in our bodies are loaded by the ground reaction force, stores the energy, and puts it back into the system. But that only pushes us straight up into the air. How do we get the horizontal force? As Tony told us, Vertical forces can only produce vertical acceleration. Horizontal forces can only produce horizontal accelerations. So in response to W, forces can only push up. They cannot push forward. So what forces propel us forward? The present model has been one of underfoot push-off and braking. As you can see, Push-off and braking require frictional shear. In this limb-driven model, the foot shears against the, the surface of the earth and pushes back, giving us push-off. As my friend Grekovetsky would tell you, shear is the enemy. 
It is wasted energy and inconsistent with the second law of thermodynamics is applied to biologic structures. Is there underfoot shear when running? These are footprints of runners on a beach of both dog and man, showing that there is no shear underfoot. Neither man nor beast create forward motion by underfoot shearing. But there is a very simple and energetically efficient way of creating forward motion. All one has to do is lean forward so the center of mass is in front of the base of support. And you can see by vectoring the forces uh, as Tony said we should, we end up with a downward motion and a forward motion. And gravity does the work for us. And it gets better. We are sliding over frictionless joints. So once we get going, there's really nothing stopping our forward motion except the wind. Although our foot may stop forward motion briefly as it touches ground, all the body parts from the ankle on up are happily moving along obeying Newton's first law, unimpeded by frictional drag. Second law of thermodynamics wins again. Evidently, some athletes and coaches are a bit ahead of what is in the biomechanics literature. Here is Mike Maggio, a walking coach. As we walk, our center of mass needs to be directly over the ball of our foot as the foot hits the ground. Your heel will strike first, and then the ball of the foot. We want to have the majority of the weight of our body directly over the ball of our foot with a bent knee. We don't have to push. Gravity will pull us forward and we're on to our next foot. He is talking about gravity uh, moving him forward and the foot being lifted off the ground. The center of mass pushes down when the center of mass is directly over the ball of the foot. Gravity pulls us forward and there's no push off. The principle is the same in running here is a runner talking about the same techniques using what is known as the pose method for walking and running. Pushing off is nothing more than wasted energy. You can do it in the vertical direction, but it doesn't help you with horizontal movement. Just the simple act of allowing yourself to fall forward is all you need to generate or maintain your forward momentum. You can fall a maximum of 22 and a half degrees past the vertical. Once you're there, it's time to pull your foot up. The paw deck is the idea that upon contacting the ground, the muscles in the legs somehow grip the ground and literally pull the body forward. Realistically, this can't happen. Our muscles alone can't propel the body forward faster than the already existing momentum. We keep talking about the center of mass, but we really... Professor explaining it. Obviously, hitting a glitch here. Let's see if it'll catch up. Give us a second. This at all of the center of mass. And if I take the derivative of this, then the PDT of the total momentum, of which we learned that the total momentum dt, the PDT, is the total external force. We already learned that earlier. I take the derivative of this equation that gives me the BDT here, and the velocity changes to acceleration. And look at this. This is really an amazing statement. This says F equals MA. But if I have here this squash racket, and here is the center of mass, then if I throw this object up in 26100, as I will do later, then the center of mass behaves as if all the mass of the entire squash racket was right at that center of mass. So the behavior of the center of mass is extremely predictable, whereas the behavior of the squash racket is not. It may start tumbling of mass. If I had here a hammer, this is a hammer. Hey, do we still have you? Obviously, we're, we're a little off. And there were no external forces. I would be somewhere in our space, muted, and Steve. it would have a...
Sorry about that. Are you, are you still muted? Let's see. Then I'm mute. That is only a call. Okay, now we can hear you, Steve. All right, did I, you want me to replay something? Yeah, because um, when we got to the Walter Lewin part, yeah, we could hear him, but we couldn't see him. All right, well, so I'm me... going to propose you get to the maybe the beginning of that part or a little before right. that. I'm working right to it, right? Just a minute. And then just start screen share again. Thanks for your patience, everyone. All right, let me see. We can, whoops. All right, I can't see what I got here. Screen Remember share. to and click that move um, to a little bit of uh... All right. Remember to click that share audio box at the I bottom. Got, I got screen. share sound. I got share sound. Yep. And I'll start it again. Can you see me? Yes. This looks good. We haven't stressed the, its importance in understanding movement. Here is my favorite physics professor, Walter Lewin from MIT, explaining Thanks. its importance. The center of mass is very, very special indeed. It has remarkable qualities and characteristics, and they are not so obvious at all. Of the center of mass. And if I take the derivative of this, then dpdt of the total momentum of which we learned that the total momentum dt, d3 dt, is the total external force. We already learned that earlier. I take the derivative of this equation. that gives me the bdt here, and the velocity changes to acceleration. And look at this. This is really an amazing statement. This says f equals ma. But if I have here this quash racket, and here is the center of mass, then if I throw this object up in 26100, as I will do later, then the center of mass behaves as if all the mass of the entire squash racket was right at that center of mass. So the behavior of the center of mass is extremely predictable, whereas the behavior of the squash racket is not. It may start tumbling of mass. If I had here a hammer, this is a hammer, and there were no external forces. I would be somewhere in outer space, and it would have a certain velocity. Then the center of mass, but only the center of mass, would have a velocity that never changes, because if there's no external force, then there is only a constant velocity. There's no acceleration. But the hammer itself may be tumbling. A little later in time, the hammer may have this position. A little earlier in time, the hammer may have had this position. Follow the, the green line. It's just one smooth motion. That is very mysterious that there is one and only one point in any one of us, in you, in me, in any object, that the center of mass behaves as if all the matter were together in one point. Of course, the physicist Krakowiecki knew this and wrote a book, The Spinal Engine, describing just that. Movement is from the center out, not from the periphery in. His video of a quad amputee demonstrating mobility through spinal movement is a classic. My take on this is that it is springs, not muscles, that fuel this engine. Unfortunately, Serge's book is out of print. With a little updating, it should be republished. I took this photo of mother and daughter walking in Guatemala several years ago, fortuitously caught them in what is called double leg stance, but I see them as floating on air. I see mother and daughter at about where the markers are at 46 and 94% of the walk phase. In the spring mass model, the low point of the center of mass occurs at single leg stance depicted here at about 32 and 82 or 3 percent of the walk phase. As they are being sprung up into the air at single leg stance, they are less than full weight bearing between left and right single leg stance. 
At the apex, which is just about where they are now, they must pretty much be airborne. And we now know that that hind foot is not pushing off, but being lifted off, and therefore non-weight bearing. So the center of mass is being sprung up into the air. It moves forward by being propelled by inertia and gravity. And until the center of mass is directly over the ball of the foot, the walker is airborne. Let's revisit Carnot and his body springs. As you recall, an animal may be considered an assembly of particles separated by compressed springs. This chart depicts all sorts of springs in the body, but they left out what I consider the most important springs in the body, the bones. The usual discussion around springs in the leg always concerns itself with muscles. For some unknown reason, no one considers the bones. But of course, bones are much better springs than muscles, and Carnot did not exclude them from his description. When you load sp stiff springs like bone and softer springs like muscles in parallel, it's the stiff springs that do all the work. Live bones are not the stiff, brittle rods that we are accustomed to see in the cadaver bone. They are bouncy and springy, much like a live tree limb. And they are not compressed from the ends like a Greek column, but rather tugged on all along its shaft by the myriad muscle and ligament transpositions. And where does all that tension come from? It has to come from the ball of the foot when the center of mass is directly over it. This is a tensegrity tower built by Bruce Hamilton sitting in my front hallway. And here it is oscillating after a gentle push. It would be just as correct to call it a spring as calling it an oscillator. Enmeshed in a continuous tension network, all the compression struts are compressed equally and operate in parallel. As this is the model for the structure of organisms, then all the compression elements of an organism must be compressed equally and in parallel. I would like to try and clear up a bit of confusion about series and parallel. In physics, series refers to events occurring one after another. Parallel is when events are occurring simultaneously and towards the same goal. Series is like a link chain with each link attached one after another. Parallel is more like the fibers of a hemp rope that are entwined with each other. As we all know, a weak link in a chain will destroy the continuity of the whole chain. They work in series, and if one doesn't work, they all don't work. In parallel, they can work all together, but not dependent on each other so that if one fails or not functioning, the others can still do their job. They are simultaneously independent and interdependent. Springs spread out in the series get longer and flimsier and are never stronger than its weakest link. Parallel forces are additive, the more the merrier. Muscles and bones working together become co-workers rather than agonists and antagonists. If tension begets compression, and bones are set in a, in a continuous tension network, compression elements in a biological tensegrity are compressed in parallel. I want you to meet Theo Janssen and his strand beasties that stroll along the Netherland beaches powered only by the wind. Their limbs move by a unique closed kinematic chain mechanism, eponymously and rightly named the Jensen mechanism. It looks very complicated, but uh, to simplify things, let's get down to the basic mechanism, which is a closed kinematic chain driven by a crank. This closed kinematic chain is analogous to the pentagraph, the sliding crank, the vector equilibrium, the Jacob's Ladder, and the cruciate ligaments of the knee, 
that we have discussed in our article about closed kinematic chains in biological organisms. Closed kinematic chains are ubiquitous in the body. It is demonstrated here in the antibody modeling system showing the quadriceps and the hamstrings co-contracting, phenomena first described by Lombard in 1903. And here it is being used to model the expansion and contraction of a virus. Back to the Theogensin mechanism. Like all kinematic chains, it is powered by a crank, which is powered by an external force, and it rotates around a center of mass, and its movement is three-dimensional, not planar. Now let's flip it upside down and recognize that all those elements are springs, and what is now powering that crank is the ground reaction force. Those forces then focus on the center of mass, and it gets a potential energy, which then can convert to kinetic energy, which moves this structure. And let's put a human element into this. It's a baseball pitcher throwing a ball that could have been a model for the Janssen mechanism. And another describing how the power comes from the center of mass. You want it open just a little bit, and then your arm, like I said, your arm just goes along for the ride. I think you should hear that again. Like I said, your arm just goes along for the ride. As Grakovetsky pointed out in 1980, it's a center of mass thing. Of course, some form of walking or running is central to all activities in all creatures. It doesn't matter who's doing what, all movement in all creatures behave as if it is coming from a central point to center of mass. Walking and running is so fundamental that you would think the mechanisms were figured out long ago. Not so. Let's go back to the first slide where I talked about dynamics as being a branch of classical mechanics that is concerned with the study of forces and their effects on motion. The other branch of mechanics is statics, which is used to analyze systems that are not going anywhere. They're stuck in static equilibrium. Although articles and books were written about the motion of animals, most of what was written was really about statics and not dynamics of animal mechanics. Pirelli is considered to be the father of modern day biomechanics and the principles he espoused in his book on the motion of animals in 1680 has essentially remained unchallenged until this day. It is static mechanics with muscles supposedly doing all the work by pulling levers. Some seven years after Borelli's death, Newton published his Principia Mathematica in which he elucidated the laws of motion and gravity and I suspect that if Borelli hung around a few more years and learned from Newton, he would have written a much different book. Movement is complex and swift and difficult to easily analyze until the 1890s when Moybridge did this remarkable series of photographs. These were done at one of my alma maters, the University of Pennsylvania, a few semesters before I matriculated there. They were done on a series of photographic plates and were the precursor to motion pictures. For the first time, motion could be analyzed not just step by step, but fraction of a second to fraction of a second. Early on, there did not seem to be much interest amongst the scientists, but the artists seemed to pay attention. The science underlying biological dynamics really came into its own in the 1970s with McNeil Alexander playing a major role in its development. His studies on the hopping kangaroo are a classic, and I pay homage to that work right from the beginning of this talk. A key finding was that kangaroos stored a lot of their energy in the springs in their legs, and they got that energy from the bounce on the ground, the ground reaction force. 
This was a key finding because it meant that the bounce in our step may be energized by external forces rather than internal forces, the muscles. But Alexander's work needs to be upgraded, and that gets us to Serge Grekovetsky's pithy aphorisms. Using internal springs powered by an external energy source makes a lot of thermodynamic sense. And the same can be said by replacing internally powered muscles with externally powered springs. And we mustn't forget that shear is the enemy. And any way that an organism can reduce shear is a victory for the second law of thermodynamics. And that gets us back to the engineer mathematician Carnot. We should be looking at ways to get maximum movement with minimum effort. An apparent excellent way to do it is to bring in those forces from outside the body into it using our springs. That would be the most suitable. There are a few models out there using spring mass systems. They seem to be simple models focusing on the legs as springs. Some more sophisticated models have used springs with dampers. But only one model I found is thought to include Carnot's concept that the entire body may be springs. But the root model being used is Borelli's lever model, and that model functions in series. And as we have discussed previously, Springs in series are more likely to weaken a system than they are to strengthen a system. I cannot envision series springs as a useful model for dancing such as depicted here, where it is quite apparent that many of the body springs are operating simultaneously and in parallel. As we have already noted, tensegrities are springs, and that's made even clearer in Ingberg's model, made entirely with springs. There are tension springs, and compression springs, nonlinear springs, and probably a few more that are not germane to this talk. The compression elements of a tensegrity, and they would be the bones in a skeletal system, and they themselves are tensegrities, function as compression springs, but they are nonlinear compression springs and can function much like shock absorbers in your automobile. the interstitial fascia, the ligaments, tendons, and muscles, all can be represented as tension springs. And in a 10 degree tower, they would be represented by the tension cables. If muscles are being used isometrically and isotonically, as they frequently are, uh, then they uh, may best be represented as turnbuckles that adjust the tension in the closed kinematic chain rather than just simple springs. And that brings us back to the heart of the subject, the center of mass. The center of mass is very, very special indeed. And to understand why, all you have to do is watch Simone Biles' vault. Thanks for this time we had together. The toe bone, the neck, the knee bone. All right. Thank you, Steve.
very good. Am I still, you're still getting sound out of that? Let me see right. That's it. All right, shut it off. Okay. Right, we're open for questions. If you'd like to put some questions in the chat or raise a hand, and you can open your uh, videos now if you wish. I'll just jump in very quickly to say, I don't know how many times I've seen this 20, 30 times, maybe more now. Um, I'm still getting new, new levels of understanding. No, we have Sorry. a... Lauren. Yes, I've also watched it several times yet. And uh, this last time I got new things again, I think. It, it doesn't stop, it always goes on. And um, my question is when we add the acting forces in parallel of parallel parts in a tensegral structure, um, do we also add tension and compression? I'm not sure how to answer that. The Anything, if you're just telling that the compression and tension are parallel structures, you can't think of them as operating separately. So that, you know, when you compress the bone to make it a compression spring, you can't compress one bone, you compress all your bones. Mm -hmm. and, and it's easy to see, just let me see if I got a piece of rope here. I didn't have it. If you pull on a rope, the tension in the rope is the same throughout the rope. Mm -hmm. And if you have rigid points within it, all the things within it are going to be compressed the same or tensioned the same. So that, you know, if the, if the body is a tensegrity system that is a continuous tension system, that means all the compression elements within it have to be under equal compression. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they're all torn. So everything is happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. So when you land on your foot as you're walking and running, you convert that compression force into a tensional force immediately that pulls up on the whole system, just as if you pulled on a pre-tensioned rope, a rope that was already under tension and give it a little jerk, everything happens at the same time. Mm -hmm. And all the compression elements within it, if there were little things caught up within it, would be under the same compression because the tension is the same throughout. Mm -hmm. So it's just consistent with the model. Now, if you don't accept the tensegrity model, then of course, you're talking another story altogether, but that gets you into series. And we know that series weakens the system, not strengthens the system. Okay, thank you. We have a question from uh, Dorothea first, I think. And then also from uh, Maureen after that. Yes. Okay, so uh, we've all admired fantastic runners like in the Olympics. And there's a lot of people who do running training. And so obviously there's more efficient and less efficient ways of running. And what is it that running training is doing? I, I assume it's not just mainly making muscles stronger. Well, you have two kinds of running you have to be concerned with. One is the sprint where you're trying to get the fastest in the shortest period, you know, in the shortest period of time. And the other is in distance runner. In, in a sprint, you use up all your energy in 10 seconds. And, you know, now you have stored energy, you can get that right back, but the available energy is used up within 10 seconds. That's why, you know, they run, they fall down. So what they have to do is come off the blocks falling on their face. So, and they're trying to get their feet in front of them before their face hits the ground. So they're moving their face very quickly in front of them, <clears throat> and, but not trying to get high in the air because you lose time when you get up in the air 
and you know you get more energy back, but you lose time. In a distance runner, it's the opposite. You want to hit the ground so that you go straight up in the air and then just lean a little bit forward. <clears throat> if you get straight up in the air, you store a lot of energy when you're up there and then you bring it back down to earth and you bounce. So you want to get as much bounce in the system as you can because that stores the energy and keeps you going. And it's almost since when falling from a height, you are essentially weightless. That means as you're coming down, you can move your limbs and it's hardly doing anything at all. It's just, you know, internal muscle forces move it without a lot of energy expenditure. <clears throat> so a marathon runner can just keep going and going and going. Now, when he starts going up and down hills, you get other problems in there, but assuming level ground, he can just go bounce, bounce, bounce all the way along, he or she, they. So you can just keep going with that. They, they get into trouble only at the end when they sprint at the last part of it. Otherwise, they could go on for another 26 miles. It doesn't make any difference. You know, it's that last bit of sprinting that gets to them. Or if they're going up and down hills, it gets a little bit, you know, cross country, it's a little more difficult. But flat, you just bounce along. Okay. Yeah. Some of the runners, as, as I showed you, some of the runners do all this instinctively anyway, but there are articles showing that um, if you distance runners should bounce higher. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, Maureen, like to ask? Yep. So what does, uh, where does this lead you in terms of training for just regular people? who are just getting older and stiffer and losing their balance, uh -huh. losing their strength. All right. You know, do they try to improve their springiness or how do you look at it for regular people? Yeah, well, one of the things you lose is the elasticity in your, in your tissue, your springiness. And as you notice, as old people, we sort of shuffle along. I've uh, said, well, I pay attention to what I said. And what I do now is I lean forward a little bit more when I walk. I look like I'm going to fall on my face, but it does it get my foot in front of me. I take a bigger step and more spring into it by doing it. So I, so I don't shuffle along like old, us old people tend to do because we lose, uh, lose our springiness. I don't know how to get the elasticity back in the system. That's part of the aging process. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's one way that I saw immediately I could affect it just by leaning a little forward. I'm falling a little faster. That means I got to get my foot in front of me, take a bigger step and get a little bit more bounce. I would just like to say that I've done a lot of ice skating and it's exactly that way that I figured out for skating. You don't, you push a little bit with your legs, but mostly you lean forward that pushes the weighted skate away and the new skate comes in to protect you from falling. Uh, this applies to all activities. You know, I thought it with walking and running, but it, it's all applicable to everything we do. So we have to rethink how we think about where we get our energy, where we store our energy and how we get that movement. That movement comes from the center core out how do we get that energy into that center core and out of there with the least amount of energy expenditure, which means we want to use our muscles less and the gravity uh, more. And to get more out of the gravity, you need stiffer springs and that's bones. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Maureen's question was a good one because we're all getting old yeah. and it's more relevant. So final, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you, Steve. Uh, can you hear me okay? Wonderful. I can hear fine. Really wonderful. Uh, I just wanted to suggest something you could add to your deck is why are the recent runners from Jamaica so much faster? And there is research on the center of gravity and the size of their chest contributing to that speed. So that would 100% support what you're saying, that they're able to, uh, the position of the belly button or center of gravity is somehow uh, giving them uh, their different body shape, in other words, is what's creating that speed advantage. Wow. 
it, it also brings up the point of what do you put on the sole of your foot? Because if you use any sort of cushioned sole, that absorbs that energy and you don't get it into the system. So of course, the best you want to do is barefoot. And from that point, you get it into your system faster and more direct without any uh, 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 interference with the forces. Can I just say, um, a lot of you will recognize Lionel as um, being the guy who's giving us the Tensegrity wikis and uh, uh, wiki. So thank you for that. And Lionel, um, do you have that research on the wiki or would you be willing to share it with us? We'd love to see it. And Chris. Can, can I just jump in here on behalf of Lionel and say to Steve and Susan, I think Graham, your bio is up there. There's a whole bio page on the Tensegrity Wiki and you're not up. There's a link. It's waiting for you. Maybe Lionel could talk about that a little bit. The most exciting thing I want to share is that uh, we moved hosts with BioTensegrity with this group's help. Susan played a big role in that. But that host turned out to not be so good, and we had a lot of friction. So uh, we now have a new host. We're going to pull the trigger soon, and uh, uh, mid-July, July 15th is our target date. So uh, it's going to be so much easier to be able to drag in images, which is something we've been dying to do because the old way was so hard. And yes, uh, Tensegrity Wiki is a great place to collect anything about Tensegrity, uh, and you're all invited to contribute that's why it's called a wiki. Thank you. So, Annette, your video is off. But, uh... Hi. Uh, thank you, Steve, for the presentation. I have a, a very technical uh, question. At the beginning of the presentation, you showed the vertical versus the horizontal uh, forces. And um, uh, from what I understand in the gate cycle, there is a, a phase uh, in, in which the, the lateral shifting at, at the frontal plane is, uh, is also playing a, a role. There, there, there must be a little bit of, of lateral shifting of the, of the hip. Uh, so the tibia would be vertical, uh, uh, to the ground when, when you stand on on the on the forward foot. So I, I wanted to ask you: Is this a sheer? Is is this a waste of uh, force? Be, the movement is really helical, so you're always twisting in that movement. So your movement is really not just forward in a helical, but your bones are not lying stiff in a column when you hit the ground. In walking or running, you have a bent knee and a bent ankle and a bent hip and a lot of other things that are bent. So you really aren't, from the standpoint of alignment of bones, it makes absolutely no biomechanical sense. From the standpoint of a tensegrity, it works fine. Mm -hmm. okay. But the spiralness is part of the movement of a tensegrity. You're, and it's like a spring, you're coiling back and forth. Thank you. Great, thank you. We're rocking along well here. So, uh, Celeste, I'd like to ask your question. You're muted, Celeste. Are we frozen? Celeste, I want to know how frozen hot... for me. Oh, Steve, that might be your connection. But Celeste, I, I want to know how hot it is where you are. Are you Today, in the heat wave? Hun, it's June. Heat, June is heat uh, wave month. Yeah, I'm sorry. Everybody was frozen for me. You have to repeat the question. No, I, I, have haven't got, I haven't gotten to it yet, Steve. I'm I was just saying again. thank you for your thank you for your presentation. And as I was listening, I was thinking if yeah. tensegrity, are getting... if tens, hold if tensegrity, what? Hold on a moment. Hold on a moment. I think Steve's got to. Yeah, I'm frozen. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, look, I'm having trouble. For some reason, my screen's frozen a little bit. So you may have to repeat things. Steve, okay. you, could shut, you could shut your video. It might save a little bandwidth. I can't hear you right hear. now, for instance. <laughs> I wasn't saying anything. Oh, okay. okay. 
All right. What about now, Steve? Can you can hear you us? Can you hear me? I can hear you all. Okay. okay. During the presentation, I was thinking, nope. if tense, if tensegrity is- No, nope. can't hear you. Hey, Steve. Hmm. Yeah, what Maybe should I you do? Wanna, do you wanna leave the meeting and come back? Do you think that would help Mariana? Yes. Or just turn the video off. Yes, or turn the video off. That could also help. Turn my video off. Yeah. Yes. That, All that right, let's try that. Okay, can you hear us now, Steve? I can hear you fine. But can, everybody, you, yeah. can, you, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. During the presentation, I was thinking, since we have arrived at this place of beginning to understand what tensegrity really is as the, a, a completely different paradigm of physiology and energy. And if the energy is from the inside out, then um, it, it seems to me to make the, all the sense in the world that the movement is energy from the inside out. You know, and there is someone, and uh, Susan may know of him. There is someone called, um, oh shoot, James. Oh, I'll think of his last name. He's Earl. a Tai Chi master, okay? Has been for 40 years. He took his Tai Chi out of the court and into athletics. He would be training tennis players, golfers, swimmers, runners, riders. Now he is ex almost exclusively working with riders in teaching people how to keep connected to their center of gravity and that that completely changes the energy dynamic that they can bring to their sport. And for riders, it completely changes your connection to the animal's center of gravity and the animal's from the center out energy. Yeah, it, I, well, I don't know which person you're talking about um, and maybe Ed or- I'll think, I'll think of the last or, name. It's, or somebody else who does Tai Chi does, but, but this is in the Tai Chi classics. This is what all um, people in Tai Chi learn, that the center is leading the action. That's, that's a central, ha ha, you and, know, and, pennant you know, of the system. I mean, what he, what he brings out, and I've only been to a couple of his seminars, is, you know, about age one, we get up on our little legs and we start toddling around. We never learn how to really walk. We just move. No one ever thinks because no one else really knows how to walk. They move. And, and when you work from his principle, as you must know, Susan, it changes everything. And we assume that everybody who figures out how to walk figures it out in the same way. And I don't think that's quite possible. No, 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 it isn't. And because the difference he has made in, in athletes, in their ability to use all of the energy in their body correctly and, and what it has done for their sport it is amazing. Yeah, well, what we try to do is put the science underneath that theory. You know, he's been working from uh, the Tai Chi people have done it for centuries, have worked that concept, but didn't have the science behind it. So we're blending, we're melding the ancient history with modern science to understand it. Okay. Because yes, they were right, but now we have science explaining why they were right. And we've been wrong all along. Hey, Steve, maybe try turning your video back on and see if we get to keep you this time. It's nice to be able to see you. Thanks. I'm here. Okay, Chris. 
Thank you, Graham. I'm not understanding, Celeste, what you're saying, what you're meaning when you say we are understanding tensegrity with energy from the inside out. When I'm mm, trying to understand what Steve's presenting, say, and it's taken me a long time, so now I'm a bit more confused, and that is in terms of movement in space, it's like the gravity meeting ground reaction force and that that's powering it. And then it's the release. Hold on, hold on Chris, I'm gonna spotlight you. Okay, I'm gonna get my little pipe cleaner here. So, and I think I'm just misunderstanding maybe what Celeste is saying. So I'm understanding it as we step down, gravity, the force of gravity meets now the ground reaction force because we're touch, we're in connection with the earth and then releasing, that's where you get that little lift off. So my understanding is that, well, I don't know if this is the right word, please um, correct me, but it's being powered from the outside in, from the external force of meeting gravity and ground reaction force. Um, so what, the energy from inside out, are you referring to like the release of that stored elastic potential or am I missing? I, I just don't understand. I mean, you guys have been in this so much longer than I, and I'm trying to feel my way into it. But, um, and, I feel like the, the, the little corkscrew you just used, Chris, it is almost too linear. I, maybe because I'm a body worker, I'm thinking of it as being, like Steve was saying, it isn't one bone, it's all of them. Um, I, I'm thinking of it as far more dynamic in many directions. Um, and, and I may be wrong, but that's from body worker perspective and enhancing overall movement within an organic mass. That movement is not linear in one direction, it's omnidirectional. That's kind of, and maybe that's because of the perspective I'm coming from, Chris. Okay, so um, I agree, actually, the movement, like that's what I feel in my body as well. And I'm wondering if by energy, maybe I'm thinking something that different than you're thinking. That's why I use the word power, because I certainly have a sense of energy being in my system. But maybe we can talk about it some other time when we both have a chance to <laughs> yeah. uh, consider and, and play in our bodies. So, so I'm, I'm very interested in, in talking more, but I have a lot to process as well. Do you want to make a comment on that, Steve, or should we move on? We can't hear you, you're muted, Steve. Steve, you're muted. I, if you during any external movement, then you have to have an external force to do it. So if you are moving in space, in gravity fields, you have to have an external force that's going to do it. And so any forces that you use have to be brought into your body from external, stored in the body and then moved out. So you're like the helicopter or rocket that stores its energy and then lifts off rather than pushes off. I'm gonna put it in a different way, slightly different way. Anytime your center of mass is moving somewhere else in space, if your center of mass is staying where it is, you can do that without um, external energy. But in order to get your center of mass to move in any direction in space, you need external forces. Would you agree, Steve? Yes, but 
you have to understand that each portion of your body also has a center of mass. So if you're just moving your arm, there's a center of mass in the arm and then you, it, the same rule, uh, rules apply. Okay, we'll move on to uh, Marin. Oh. Okay, um, I was also, also uh, thinking about that um, from inside out and from outside in. And I think um, training is much about um, using external forces and bring them inside and use these forces not only to be moved by, but also to always reorganize the own body. And if there are no external forces, the own body is, feels weaker than it does when there are external forces. And so I think movement is always um, an interaction. It's not something that comes from in, inside out or from outside in. It's the interaction with gravity and ground reaction forces. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Um, Doug, if you'd like to ask your question. Uh, actually, just a further comment on the same topic. It seems like there, sometimes the confusion is the distinct, distinguishing between our ability, the, the basically internal and external forces, that our ability to reconfigure our structure um, which can be done without external forces. Uh, and, you know, Simone, Simone Biles flying through the air, reconfiguring her structure is at that point done without external forces since she's flying through the air. And in the process of doing that, she's changing her relationship to her center of mass, which allows for the creation of all those different um, tumbling moves. Um, then there is the there are the external forces which can be ground reaction force, but it can also be uh, you, your hand on someone's back. Um, and then and then the complexity is of course that there is the the point of the, the point or the 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 actual interface from external to internal, and then the the use or the allowing of those forces to to reconfigure ourselves as well. So I mean there's an incredible nuance. And I think I think a challenge of the conversation is sometimes we're one person's talking about one of those things and somebody's talking about another. Um, but it's a it's a rich um, multiplicity of possibilities there. And I'll put a question mark at the end. Can I just add a little bit to that? that um, ground reaction force, when we, when we walk or run, as the foot comes down, it carries the weight of our bodies, but also the accelerated force due to gravity. So the foot hits the ground with a much greater force than it would if we touch it very lightly. It's that gravity going into the body which helps to tighten the springs and um, help us to move. It's putting energy into the system, the same as we use food to put energy into a system as well, the different sources of energy. I hope that fits in. That's why run. That's why distance runners have to gain height with their running. When they gain height, they gain accelerating force. They hit the ground harder. They bounce harder. And if they want to go faster, they have to lean forward a little bit more. But it's the bouncing up and down is you know if they go higher, then they hit hit the ground with accelerating force. The longer you're in the air, the more, and falling, the more force you hit the ground with. So by going a little bit higher, you hit the ground a, a lot faster because by the, the square of the time you're in the air. So the longer you can stay in the air, the 
you hit the ground a little harder and then you bounce a little more. Doug, your hand is still up. Have you another question or is anybody else? Another question. Yeah, another question. <laughs> An okay. actual question. Uh, Steve, you were, you were contrasting the, the, the long distance versus the sprinting runners. And, um, and one, of, one of the aspects being that essentially the, the more and more efficient a runner becomes, they can essentially run all day long. Um, so, and that you're leaning forward more to go faster, but also the, the sprint runners are actually um, exerting a lot of internal energy. They're, they're, I, people say that the, and I recollect that the, the 400 meter is just the hardest race of all because you, you completely spend all of your energy. We're losing you, Doug. So what, if um, using that energy. To... Oh, hello. Hello. Can you repeat the last? Uh... Hello. Can you hear us, Doug? Yeah, I think I yep. understand. Yep. Yeah, I think I understand the question enough. Cool. He wants to know, you know, how how are these people using their energy? Well, they're using their energy by punching the ground. They are expanding the body and striking the ground. So they hit the ground, they're punching it. And so they are pushing off in a sense, because they're, but they're pushing off to get vertical. So what they do is they're contracting their body and then expanding it and striking the ground. So they're taking that energy and beating at it, but that requires a lot of muscles to do that because you're expanding and contracting your muscles. So it exhausts them. The distance runner, doesn't do that, they try and keep their muscles isometric and isotonic so that they stay the same length and the same tension through their cycle movement. And by doing that, they use very little energy of, of their muscles. And it's just the bouncing up and down and the slight lean forward. And by keeping their muscle, muscles isometric and isotonic, they waste hardly any energy, while the sprinter is constantly pumping those muscles and banging at, at the ground and hitting it. And that takes energy. It's just what Rakovetsky tells you. Right, Mariana. I just have a silly example of how this applies to normal life. Wednesday, last Wednesday, I'm, I'm working out uh, on a regular basis, but I think I overdid my workout. So every single muscle in my legs are painful now because of the work I did. So the only way I can walk, uh, like walk is actually on my, on my toes and I'm kind of bouncing. And if I do that, it, they don't hurt. So if I try walking or going up the stairs normally, I'm in pain, like, oh, I, and, but if I just jump in on my toes fast, there's no pain. So I think that's a very clear example of using my bones as the springs instead of my muscles to move, right? Yeah, just lean forward a little more. Yeah, that, of, of course, I'm doing that, but I have my back. So, so, and that's the reason why I'm sitting here in the couch instead of standing the same way I, I'm usually is because I'm in such pain. <laughs> I just sit and relax. So yeah, but I think that's a good example. Thank you, Mariana. Chris? Uh, thank you. And I, like Mariana, have been really exploring this idea of the springy step because we've been visiting it a lot in the trailblazers. And I have a hyperflexible body that has for a long time been kind of like a sloppy tensegrity. And so for several months now, I've been playing. I've been going out for little jaunts in the woods that I'm not calling running because it's not really running. And so my question because of that, Steve, is you talk about the bones being the, the springs, the major springs, and you showed the picture of the, the something pot, you know, where, where we know that the stiffer, the bones are the stiffest springs. So then they're doing the most of the powering. The dash pot. The dash pot. Thank you, Susan. And so my question is around this. So 
because I have been really focusing on the bones and finding the springiness in the bones. And then I've been also playing with or, or realizing that, but we're always working with the whole body. And so while my focus is on the bones, I'm also at the same time, you know, increasing the tension in the soft tissue, say the ligaments and releasing. So two things, one is that that given the, like the high jumpers have stiffer Achilles and such that tensional spring could also be adding power. And that's a question, not a statement. And the second is, and at the same time, it does feel like my overall balance in my body of tension and compression is becoming more healthy. So you talk about, and, and Leonid and Marianne also talk about the, the muscles as being the, well, you talk about Miss Turnbuckles or Mariana and Leonid about toners tensioning the system. To me, it's kind of both and. Is that heading the right direction? Yeah. The, the, the importance is that if you're changing your length of muscle or changing the tone of muscle, you're using energy that you don't want to use. So you want to keep things isometric and isotonic. If you go back to the times you were doing any athletic thing, it's always ready, get set, go. The get set is when you're tuning up your muscles to its optimum for that particular event. And what you're doing is tightening your turnbuckles. If you don't recognize what a turnbuckle is, it's a turnbuckle. By turning this, you tighten the system. So what you're doing at that point is you're setting the tone of your muscles for the optimum event. At that point, theoretically, you don't want to do anything by loosening or tightening those muscles. So you want to keep them in a closed kinematic chain that is a constant. So everything is moving as one. Now, that's all theoretical, of course. Now, I'm sure there are instances when you have to change that, but that always uses energy. Mm. So the idea then is to set yourself so you are optimum isometric toned and keep it. And you can feel when that happens and you can also feel when you lose it. Right. And, so and, and is, thing, Go uh, ahead. Yeah, so any rhythmic pattern exercise running, swimming, walking, whatever, biking, any of those rhythmic pattern exercise, that's your optimum. That's when you are best, when you can set that tone and just go. Mm -hmm. uh, so the asymmetrical movements and things like that, you're always changing tone because different things are happening. So mm -hmm. if you're playing tennis, for instance, you're changing your tone all the time. But if you're running, doing a rhythmic pattern exercise, any of those rhythmic pattern movements, then you're trying to maintain the steady muscle tone throughout the system as a constant. Okay, and if somebody else has a question, then I'm happy to pass it on. And if they don't, I wanna share something that Gwen and I were talking about. And Gwen is specifically hoping that you will answer for her. Again, you have to understand that I'm giving you answers that are all theoretical that I'm making up on the fly. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially, <laughs> this is not in any of the books. It is not the way it is taught in any of the books. This is the distillation of the concept of how a tensegrity structure will work. In Which an optimal on, or idealized setting, in an idealized way, too. Go ahead, Susan. Sorry. Yeah, but, but which is based on you know, the theory of the last theories that have evolved, emerged in the last thousand years, right? right. Theory, inventions, yeah. different things. Um, There's something I said that is an absolute science. Right. You no, know, it's your, you know, it's science. It's a distillation of the science. Okay. So we want to hear Gwen's question. Diane, did you have a question? I can't tell whether you're raising your hand or not.
you figure yeah, out how to. I, I just, I have a comment when you're ready. Okay, why don't you go after Chris finishes then? Oh, how about Glenn? Okay, go ahead. Well, why don't you go right now while you're unmuted, Gwen? I mean, <laughs> sorry, Diane. <laughs> Diane. Okay, okay. I just want to comment, go back to something Steve said early on about the importance of keeping the elasticity in the tissues. Um, and this is, uh, this is where we get this idea of energy from the inside out. You have to have that elasticity and you have to have a way of, of restoring it and maintaining it, okay? I just turned 79 and I get to say, okay, I've been doing Bartenia Fundamentals all these a years. A child. What? A, I know, a mere child. Um, I've been doing fundamentals all these years and this is why I am still on my feet. And I do re that, that notion that you have that elasticity in your body. Your body is there for you when you need it. And of course that comes from, I mean, ideas of Tai Chi and, and so forth and all of that. But the notion of um, systematic variety of movement done in uh, a rhythmic uh, way, is, is what works. That's my comment. Thank you, Diane. Uh, all our, uh, there are a lot of um, questions. They've all been asked live. So if anyone feels they have a burning question but doesn't want to come up front, then put it in the chat and we'll hopefully get to it. We've only got a few more minutes left. So. So Chris, maybe we can have Gwen's question then. Okay, if nobody else has a question they wanna ask. So Gwen was talking about the turnbuckles and our idea of a turnbuckle is it's shortening the muscle. And then also about the, I mean, my muscle doesn't like, like some people's do, but, but the, what do we wanna call it? The condensation of a muscle and expanding oxetically. She wanted more clarification around that. <laughs> I see her. From my standpoint, looking at it, muscles don't shorten when they are stiffened. They expand when they are stiffened. You see, because they bulk up, but you do you can do an isometric. You know, shortening uh, isometric tensioning of your muscle, and there's no shortening. So bulking up doesn't mean that it's shortening. And ideally, that's what you're doing. It is well known that any shortening or lengthening of a muscle from its resting length weakens the muscle. Therefore, why in the hell would we do it? We don't do it. We just thought we've done it. But you're just expanding, you know, you're keeping your muscle a resting length almost all the time because it's always working in part of a closed kinematic chain. So this is nonsense that we are shortening and lengthening muscles. It just doesn't make sense. It's contrary to the second law in thermodynamics and to wasting energy and everything that Greg Kovetsky talked about. So my um, image that comes to mind when you talk about the muscles um, bulk up to, in order to tension is the idea, and I know it's not the same, but when we blow up a, a balloon, it bulks up in all directions and the tension and the skin of the ba balloon increases. So could that be also a way of tuning the tension in the system? Absolutely. And emerging these two thoughts of turnbuckle or these two images of turnbuckles. But, yeah, and but that's what the turnbuckle, when I talk about turnbuckles, I, I talk about it's functional actually than it's physical. That's what I thought, but I promised when I was I think of it as being functional a turnbuckle rather than physical. That's so what I behavior. Tightening up. The behavior. That's what I said to Gwen too, but we want to hear it from Steve because he understands more than we do. 
I told you, I make it up as I go along. But I mean, this is how it's evolved as I kept saying, well, that can't possibly work. You can't shorten a muscle. You know, I learned in, you know, in physics 101, you know, when I was in physiology 101, that you shorten a muscle and it weakens it. You lengthen a muscle and it weakens it. Why would anybody in their right mind be doing that? I still have a hard time not using the word contraction. I'm really trying. But so I'm, I'm so do my, I. my tendency is like when you activate the muscle or where you, but it's very hard once you have it in you for so long not to use the word contraction. Okay. Susan, where are we in the time? Sorry there. Hi. Um, yeah, I think we're probably getting ready for final toast. Steve, we're going to be toasting you. Happy birthday and bon voyage, I think. Thanks. Jumping, jumping over to Europe for a few weeks to celebrate your 90th. Yep, yep, I'm there. <laughs> hey, and what amazes me is my brain's still working and so is my body. So uh, I'm very happy. Congratulations, okay. Steve. Thank you. All right. Well, sorry, Steve, to do this to you, but happy birthday, Steve. Uh, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank it's you in a lot. few weeks, so close enough. Thank you. Just a couple of weeks, that's it. Yeah. How does it feel to be nearly 90 and have accomplished all of this? Another day older and deeper in debt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll say goodbye to uh, our YouTube guests and visitors. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on, Steve, to... Uh, Give us your presentation, which I've seen before, but it's always good to go over it over and over again. So thank you all for coming as well. Thanks, thank everyone. Thanks, Steve. Happy birthday. Hello. Susan, do you want to say anything about this being the end of our very short season and what might be coming <laughs> up? Yeah, if you're on the Biotensegrity Archive email list, biotensegrityarchive.org, then you'll find out when we're putting things together, which remember, this is all an all volunteer effort. All the cookies are being baked by hand. So um, things, things happen when we are able to put something together. Uh, sometimes we know a bit in advance when that's going to be. Sometimes it's a little more impromptu. But if you're on the archive email list, um, when we do have something to share, we'll pop out a newsletter and uh, you can join us again. So thanks, Chris, for reminding me to say that. And thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Lovely to see you.